Good morning. Hope you've had a good week. We're in for another terrific day, so I hope you're getting outside and enjoying the sunshine and, uh, and the fresh air. We're going to try and cover a couple chapters today, so we'll be uh, busy getting into the detail of uh, our next lesson. So before we start, let's uh, open with a word of prayer. Our Father God, thank you for being with us here this morning. Thank you for the great weather and the flowers and the grass that's growing pretty well right now. And we thank you for the fall. Uh, please be with us this morning as we continue to study the book of Ezekiel. In thy name we pray. Amen. As I said, we're going to cover 24 and 25 today. And so I want to review a little bit before we get into the details of the lesson. Um, remember, Ezekiel lived with the fellow ex exiles in, uh, in Babylon. And his divine call in chapter 1 uh, forced him to suppress any internal tendencies of an early return to Jerusalem because eventually God would tell him that uh, the city was going to be no more. Uh, in chapter 24, uh, Ezekiel delivers to his fellow Jews a harsh, a heart-rending, a hope-crushing world of divine judgment. Jerusalem would fall, the temple would be destroyed. He did this in a variety of ways, acting out sermons, allegories, visions uh, that we've seen in the past. And in chapter 24, he uses also the death of his wife uh, as a teaching tool for, um, for the exiles. Chapter 24 concludes with a section of, uh, of as I said, another uh, allegory. Uh, and it talks about a boiling pot representing Jerusalem and all her cities, both uh, all his citizens, both the good folks and the bad folks. There's also rust on the pot, which seems to exemplify the idolatry and the corruption that's taking place. Uh, the second half of chapter 24 is another action sermon. As I mentioned, his wife suddenly dies unexpectedly. Uh, and God has told him to act in a certain way as a demonstration to uh, his fellow exiles when they hear of the death of uh, Jerusalem, the city, and the temple. Chapter 25 is a start of a second unit. Uh, and if you look at the chart uh, that I have up there, you'll see that 24 finishes this first unit, first major uh, section of Ezekiel. And chapter 25 starts a second uh, section for chapters 25 through 32. Um, the second section, 25 through 32, stands apart from uh, the material that uh, came before it, which we just finished, and that which will come after it. This section, uh, the second section that we'll start today, uh, delivers prophecy about nations uh, other than Israel. Uh, there are similar prophecies in Isaiah in uh, several chapters and in Jeremiah. There are seven nations that are named, Ammon, Moab, Eden, Philistia, Tyre, Sidon, both of those are cities, and Egypt. These nations that I've just named and that are discussed in chapters 25 through 32 uh, are involved in Israel's political intrigues of the past. We know that they have combined with them to, uh, as allies to fight Babylonia. Um, but they also uh, intended to prey on Israel's demise and Judah's current situation. God will use Nebuchadnezzar, again, as his instrument of judgment against these nations uh, because they are enemies of Israel. The other item of importance in this section are seven dates. We've come across three or four prior to this, but uh, in this next section there'll be more dates, which we can use to understand a little better the historical background in which uh, the words of Ezekiel are written and uh, we'll get confirmation of Israel's fall. Uh, so let's, uh, let's get started in chapter 24. Let's call this the boiling pot allegory. 
Uh, the first prophecy in chapter 24 occurs on 15 January 588 BC. This is the fourth date that we witnessed in this first uh, 24 chapters. This is the date that Nebuchadnezzar begins his attack on Jerusalem. This is a date also observed by the Jews during the 70 years in captivity. Um, the temple, or, I mean the, uh, the attack on Jerusalem began in the 10th month, and these are Jewish calendars by the way, but you can think of them as a roll through um, the 10th month, and then later on after the beginning of the year in the 4th month, uh, the walls are breached, the temple is burned in the fifth month, and Gedaliah, Get the uh, ambassador governor who was assassinated and appointed by Babylon, uh, he is uh, killed in the seventh month. So the exiles, while they're in Babylonia you know, over those 70 years, annually observe these four dates. If we go back to chapter 11, uh, recall that Jerusalem Jews considered themselves better than the Jews in exile. In the allegory that we're about to read, uh, the Jerusalem Jews are described as the best cuts of meat. Remember, this is a boiling pot allegory. While the exiles were mere scraps of meat, God makes it clear that the exiles will form the remnant which he will use to rebuild the country again. God warns Jerusalem Jewish leaders that they aren't the meat, but they're the butchers. They are guilty of shedding innocent blood, and God will judge them for their sins. In this parable about the cooking pot, Ezekiel uses uh, several images and a vocabulary about uh, Jerusalem's leaders. Uh, the best cuts of meat go into the pot and is boiled with the bones. So let's open up this allegory in chapter 24 with the first five verses. In the ninth month, in the tenth, in the ninth year, in the tenth month, on the tenth day, the word of the Lord came to me. This is 588 BC. Son of man, record this date, this very date, because the king of Babylon has laid siege to Jerusalem this very day. Tell this rebellious house a, rab a parable and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Put on the cooking pot, put it on and pour water into it. Put into it pieces of meat, all the choice pieces, the leg and the shoulder. Fill it with the best of these bones. Take the pick of the flock. Pile wood beneath it for the bones. So bring it to a boil and cook the bones in it. So he's talking about this allegory we have yet to identify what it means. Now Jerusalem was an evil city, filled with sin like a filthy pot encrusted with rust and scum. And we talked about this last Sunday a little bit. The leaders had shed innocent blood and hadn't even bothered to cover it up. The evidence was left for everyone to see and God would avenge the innocent and expose the murderers. Verse 6. For this is what the Sovereign Lord says, Woe to the city of bloodshed, to the pot now encrusted, whose deposits will not go away. Empty it piece by piece without casting lots for them. For the blood she shed is in her midst. She poured it out on bare rock. She did not pour it out on the ground, where the dust would cover it up. To stir up wrath and take revenge, I put her blood on the bare rock, so that it would not be covered. Uh, God wasn't just going to uh, cook the meat. <laughs> he was going to boil the meat and the bones until the pot itself was destroyed. The people of Jerusalem had a uh, false confidence that um, because the Jews were his chosen people and Jerusalem his holy city, they and the city would not be destroyed. And God was about to uh, again tell them that this was not the case. It really was because it was Jerusalem was God's holy city and because of their sins he could not allow it to uh, continue wallowing in, in their wickedness. Uh, verse 9 Therefore this is what the Sovereign Lord says Woe to the city of bloodshed I too will pile the wood high 
So heap on the wood and kindle the fire. Cook the meat well, mixing in the spices and let the bones be charred. Then set the empty pot on the coals until it becomes hot and its copper glows, so its impurities may be melted and its deposit burned away. It, was, it, it has frustrated all efforts. Its heavy deposit has not been removed, not even by fire. Now your impurity is lewdness. Because I tried to cleanse you, but you would not be cleansed from your impurity. You will not be clean again until my wrath against you has subsided. I, the Lord, have spoken. The time has come for me to act. I will not hold back. I will not have pity, nor will I relent. You will be judged according to your conduct and your actions, declares the Lord. Um, chapter uh, 24 uh, now shifts a little bit um, when Ezekiel's wife suddenly dies. Um, we have other Bible stories about prophets' wives. Uh, you'll recall Abraham twice called his wife a sister <laughs> in order to save himself. Uh, Moses was criticized for marrying a Cushite as his wife. Uh, Isaiah's wife was a prophetess. Uh, God wouldn't allow Jeremiah to have a wife. And as you recall, Hosea's wife became a prostitute. But Ezekiel pays even a greater price than all of these prophets. Uh, in order to give his message, Ezekiel had to see his wife die suddenly, and he was not to show great grief because of it. God had a plan. God told him his wife would suddenly pass away, and he was not to do the things usually done in times of bereavement. He was allowed to groan quietly, but not to weep or throw ashes on his head. And so let's uh, open up that section of chapter 24, of verse 15. The word of the Lord came to me, the Son of Man, with one blow I am about to take away from you the delight of your eyes. Yet do not lament or weep or shed any tears. Groan quietly. Do not mourn for the dead. Keep your turban fastened and your sandals on your feet. Do not cover the lower part of your face or eat customary food of mourners. So I spoke to the people in the morning, and in the evening my wife died. The next morning I did as I had been commanded. So when the Jews find out uh, about his wife and they come to console him, they were shocked to see his failure uh, to lament, as was their custom. The prophet's wife was the joy of his life and the desire of his eyes, but the Lord would take it away. While on the other hand, for the people, the temple in Jerusalem was the joy of the Jewish people, but the Lord would take it away. Um, on 14 August 586 BC the temple was sacked and burned by the Babylonians. Uh, once again Ezekiel was assigned to the exiles about what God was doing. The people were to mourn over the loss of the temple the same way he had mourned for the loss of his wife. Ezekiel had one day's notice his wife passing away. The people, however, had years. Uh, the woman who died was innocent, but the temple had become a den of thieves and was hardly called innocent. Ezekiel's wife died on the day the temple was destroyed. Five months later, in, on 8 January 585 BC, a messenger arrives in Babylon with the news of the fall of the temple. On this day, it's, it's uh, an important date because on this day, uh, Ezekiel could speak freely. If you remember back in chapter 21, God told him he was to remain in his house. And I don't mean that he was bound to his house, but the people, because he was a prophet, wanted uh, to know what God was thinking. But Ezekiel was always silent about God's ideas and God's message until God told him that you can now deliver this message. Um, so his enforced silence uh, underscored Israel's stubborn refusal to uh, take God's word seriously. And so after 
he receives from this messenger that the temple has fallen, he is now allowed to speak anytime he would like. In 585, his message would become one of hope and not one of doom. And so I'm in chapter 24, verse 19. Then the people asked me, won't you tell us what these things have to do with us? Talking about his, the death of his wife. So I said to them, the word of the Lord came to me, say to the house of Israel, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I'm about to desecrate my sanctuary, a stronghold in which you take pride, the delight of your eyes, the object of your affection. The sons and daughters you left behind, those in Jerusalem, will fall by the sword, and you will do as I have done. In other words, not grieve normally. You will not cover the lower part of your face or eat the customary food of mourners. You will keep your turbans on your heads and your sandals on your feet. You will not mourn or weep, but will, but will waste away because of your sins and groan among yourselves. They're not, they're not uh, to mourn for a holy city and, a, and, and God's temple, but for a den of thieves and uh, people who didn't represent who God was. Ezekiel will be assigned to you. You will do just as he has done. When this happens, you will know that I am the Sovereign Lord. And you, son of man, on the day I take away your stronghold, your joy and your glory, the delight of their eye and their heart, of, the, of their eyes and their heart's desire, and their sons and daughters as well, on that day a fugitive will come to tell you the news. At that time your mouth will be open, you will speak with him, and you will no longer be silent. So you will be assigned to them, and they will know that I am the Lord. Well, that finishes chapter 24, and now we get into this new section about the prophecies against nations. Um, frequently in the books of the prophets, God's judgment on Israel is accompanied by oracles of judgments on other nations surrounding Israel. While judgment begins with the family of God, the pagan nations would not escape God's wrath. Often these judgments meant salvation for Israel since they uh, removed one of Israel's enemies. But in this case, the seven nations would suffer, the likes of Judah, who would, uh, who would not be saved. The Jewish claims of the one and only true God meant that the other nations worshipped only dead idols. These Gentile nations also remembered and resented their military defeats uh, at the hand of Israel. Uh, then these nations saw the hypocrisy in Israel as the Jews took on the practices of the Gentile gods. Nothing pleased the Gentiles more than to laugh at the Jews in their humiliation and claim that the Babylonian gods were more powerful than the gods the Jews worshipped. So the the problem God has with these nations is that not only uh, have they thought and are jealous of, uh, of the Jewish nations, but they saw the hypocrisy in the Jewish nation as they, they turned to the same practices as their neighbors. And then they laughed and were glad to see that the Jewish nation suffered at the hands of Babylon. So <clears throat> what these nations didn't realize was that the destruction of Jerusalem was just punishment, as we have talked about time over the last 24 chapters, and a warning to the Gentiles that they need to uh, turn to him. Israel knew God's word and sinned with that knowledge, but the Gentiles had witness of uh, who God was, and so they were without any excuse. God was also implying uh, or judging them for the way they had treated his people. So let's open up... Uh, no. Before we do that, I want to go to a, a familiar verse in Genesis uh, chapter 12, and, and this has to do with blessings and curses on the nation of Israel, and it's God talking to Abraham, and we'll remember this uh, very clearly. Uh, I'm in Genesis 12, 1. The Lord said to Abram, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make unto you a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who curse. I will bless those who bless you, 
and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. So God promised that uh, those nations that cursed his people and his, his land uh, would be cursed. Uh, the countries of Ammon, Moab, and Eden were all blood relatives of the Jews. <laughs> you would think that we could all get along, right? Especially if you're, they're your uh, blood relatives. The Ammonites and the Moabites uh, were related to Israel through Lot's through Lot, Abraham's nephew. You recall uh, Ammon and Moab were two sons born out of an incestuous relationship with Lot and his two daughters. Edom, on the other hand, is the name for Jacob's twin brother Esau. And you remember the, the um, confrontation between those two brothers. And so you would think that, uh, that a nation related by blood would be supportive of one another. But three, these three nations had a long-standing hatred of Israel. In each, in each case, God gives a reason for judgment. Uh, and you'll recognize it as we read it. He said, at one point, he'll say, because, and then explain the reason. And then a description of the judgment will follow with, therefore. And so we'll look for those keys. So let's first uh, talk about the country of Ammon. When Israel marched into the Promised Land, God told them not to attack the land of Ammon and uh, Moab because he had given them the land. Ammon and Moab uh, later both attacked Israel and they were defeated, one of the first battles that uh, Moses had to fight on the way. The Ammonites rejoiced when Jerusalem was destroyed and God saw to it that Nebuchadnezzar would defeat Ammon after destroying Jerusalem. And so uh, let's look at the first seven verses of chapter 25, which is a prophecy against Ammon. The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, set your face against the Ammonites and prophesy against them. Say to them, hear the word of the sovereign Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says. So here's this phrase, because you said, aha, over my sanctuary when it was desecrated and over the land of Israel when it was laid waste and over the people of Judah when they went into exile. Therefore, the discipline, I am going to give you to the people of the east and that being Babylon as a possession. They will set up their camps and pitch their tents among you. They will eat your fruit and drink your milk. I will turn Rabbah, which is the capital of Ammon, into a pasture for camels and Ammon into a resting place for sheep. Then you will know that I am the Lord, for this is what the sovereign Lord says. Because you have clapped your hands and stamped your feet, rejoicing with all the malice of your heart against the land of Israel. Therefore, I will stretch out my hand against you and give you as plunder to the nations. I will cut you off from the nations and exterminate you from the countries. I will destroy you and you will know that I am the Lord. Um, the next country that we have the prophecy against is Moab. Uh, Moab was uh, proud because they thought that their country was impregnable. They were located, uh, if you uh, look on this map that I'm going to show, uh, they were located um, uh, between the high mountains um, with the Dead Sea on the west and the desert on the east. So they thought they were protected. It was the king of Moab, if you remember, who hired Balaam back in the Old Testament to uh, curse Israel. And it was the Moabites who induced the Israelites to sin against the Lord by sending their women to the, to the army. Uh, the Moabites refused to see Israel as God's special people. And so I'm again in Ezekiel chapter 25, verse 8 this time. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. Because Moab and Seir said, Look, the house of Judah has become like all other nations. Therefore, I will expose the flank of Moab, beginning at its frontier towns, Beth Jezumoth, Val Melon, and Kirathiam. The glory of that land. I will give Moab along with the Ammonites to the people of the east as a possession so the Ammonites 
will not be remembered among the nations, and I will inflict punishment on Moab. Then they will know that I am the Lord. Uh, the next country that uh, that we'll talk about is Eden. Um, the Ammonites, uh, the Edomites, uh, hated the Jews because Esau was tricked uh, into selling his birthright, and we all remember that story. Uh, Esau was born first, um, his brother second, Jacob, uh, but yet his mother and his, and her son conspired and tricked Isaac to uh, give Jacob the birthright instead of Esau. So there was continued anger uh, in the country against Israel for that very thing. So when Israel was attacked, the Edomites cheered, and they didn't give any help to the refugees who tried to escape uh, the Babylonian surge. Uh, they helped, in fact, Babylon capture uh, the fleeing people. And so, uh, again, I'm in chapter 25, verse 12. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. Because Edom took revenge on the house of Judah and became very guilty by doing so, therefore, this is what the Sovereign Lord says, I will stretch out my hand against Edom and kill its people and their animals. I will lay it waste, and from Teman to Eden, they will fall by the sword. I will take vengeance on Edom by the hand of my people Israel, and they will deal with Edom in accordance with my anger and my wrath. They will know my vengeance, declares the Sovereign Lord. So the last country that's discussed in here is one very familiar to us, Philistia. The Philistines, you can recall that um, David and uh, the country, especially during the judges, uh, frequently were in um, war against uh, Philistia. Philistia was on the coast. Um, again, you can look at the map. It was on the coast and were constantly raiding uh, into the country and there was constant battle. Um, so having dealt with the nation uh, related to Israel, God now sets his face against Philistia and Phoenicia especially the cities of Tyre and Sidon. Uh, so we'll finish off with Philistia today, and then uh, we have a couple chapters, actually, that speak to Tyre and Sidon, and uh, which are cities in Phoenicia. The Philistines especially cultivated a national hatred for the Jews, and they took every opportunity to fight them. And so let's finish off with the chapter. Um, <clears throat> Ezekiel chapter 25, verse 15. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. Because the Philistines acted in vengeance and took revenge with malice in their hearts and with ancient hostility, sought to destroy Judah. Therefore, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. I'm about to stretch out my hand against the Philistines, and I will cut off the Carathites and destroy those remaining along the coast. I will carry out great vengeance on them and punish them in my wrath. Then they will know that I am the Lord when I take vengeance on them. Um, note that uh, God doesn't say anything about uh, taking vengeance on Babylonia, which is also a pagan nation. Recall that he is using Babylonia as his instrument to punish not only Israel, but the countries surrounding Israel, who made fun of them because of uh, their demise against the Babylonians or had some historical uh, prejudice against them or laughed at their hypocrisy because they had accepted and done uh, and worshipped the very gods that the nation surrounding them had worshipped um, while at the same time claiming themselves to be special people. And at times, these nations uh, either enjoyed their demise or assisted the Babylonian army in, in the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. Uh, so it's a, it's a whole new section, um, different from what we've had in the past. And so this will go on for 
for several chapters. And as I said, we'll spend a little bit of time talking about uh, Tyre and uh, its importance in the, in the ancient world at the time, as well as Egypt. Uh, hope you have a great week this week. Uh, get out and enjoy the sunshine and, uh, uh, and the nice weather. Uh, please be safe and um, uh, we'll be praying for each and every one of you. Let's bow our heads. Father God, thank you for uh, this beautiful day. Thank you for the opportunity to teach and learn. Uh, may we take these lessons into our own faith walk and help us be a better person for you. Be with us uh, throughout this coming week and bring us back safely next Sunday. In thy name we pray. Amen. Have a great week.